I have to admit that um, um, I had been looking forward to this particular passage for really since I, you know, felt directed to preach through this discourse because this passage has what really is my favorite verse in it. I know that I say that all the time, this is my favorite verse, but this really is. John fifteen sixteen has done, it just struck something in me at a young age and, and um, it, um, it, it really is what I would consider a life verse. But I have um, admittedly felt um, a different direction in how I'm going to preach through this passage. And in the course of it, I've shocked myself just a little bit at how passionate I found myself concerning this topic. I'm going to talk about a topic for a few weeks from these verses. It's the topic of friendship. And if you're familiar, I know it's not Christmas time, but if you're familiar with the movie It's a Wonderful Life, George, the main character played by Jimmy Stewart, is led through a vision of what the world would be like without him. And his guide through this vision is an angel in training by the name of Clarence. At the end of the story, George, of course, has this epiphany of all the good that he's brought to the world and the blessings that he's received as a consequence of it. And he notices a book laying on the table in front of him, and he picks the book up. It's a copy of Tom Sawyer. And on the first page is a message from Clarence, which is actually a quote from Mark Twain. But the the message is this. No man is a failure who has friends. Um, Mark Twain, from everything you can see, is pretty much an abject heathen, but He really got that right. No man is a failure who has friends. And I'm blessed to have many good friends. I know the value of it. But one of the reasons I know the value of having good friends is because I've also known what it means to not have hardly any. Uh, I had a number of good friends as I was in high school growing up, those are the first significant real relationships that I, that I think made a mark on my life. One good friend in particular, and we encouraged each other in the Lord as we uh, grew together through our you know, later teenage years. But I went through the majority of my 20s without any close friends to speak of. Um... I've almost argued with the Lord about whether or not I'm going to share this testimony, but I feel like I should because I think some folks might identify with it in different ways. There were a number of things that contributed to my not having friends. The first of which is I got married at a very early age. I got married at 20. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't have friends anymore, but what it did mean for me at the time is pretty much all of my peers were at a different stage of life than I was. And they couldn't identify with me. I had different things in life that I was going through, and I wasn't ready to hang out with old people yet. So so I, I wound up distancing myself just a little bit as a consequence of being married. Then, to make matters even more complicated, I had my first child at 22, and maybe some of my peers might have been getting married at that point. However, I was to the point where I had a child to raise, and by the time I was 23, I had two. Both Danielle and Hannah are 25 years old right now. That's called twins the hard way. (laughs) Irish twins. Um, But it also meant that I, I didn't identify with people my own age nearly as much. To complicate it even further, I moved a lot. Uh, The reason I moved a lot was I was in school. I moved for my undergraduate work from my hometown, and I spent some time there. While I was in undergraduate work, I worked for three different churches in four years. And 
Every last one of them were dead as a hammer. Older guys in the faith would look at me and say, everybody's got to walk through their valley of dry bones. Well, I'm telling you, these were the churches that would rise first in the rapture because the dead in Christ shall rise first. And, and they were predominantly older country churches with a few people hanging on, and they just brought students in because they could control us. And well, it's true. I mean, they brought students in because they could pay us a dime and then control us, and we were you know, thrilled to death to get the opportunity. But I didn't make friends in those places. They wasn't close, you know, there wasn't close relationships. And, and then I also uh, moved again to go to seminary. So you bounce around a lot, and then you move to different towns, and it just prevents you from establishing significant relationships. Um, at least that's what I told myself. To make... To complicate it even further, I, got, I was being educated in the Baptist educational system. And listen, I love Baptists. I love Southern Baptists. They taught me how to read the Bible. Their educational system is not only excellent, it's actually pretty inexpensive by a lot of other comparisons. So I'm very grateful for them. However, when I got filled with the Spirit and started speaking in tongues and laying hands on people and they started getting healed, they treated me like I had the plague. And, um, you know, you've heard the right hand of fellowship. Well, I got the left foot of fellowship, quite literally got fired from one of, my church, one of the churches that I was at. And the school that I was attending, you know, treated me like I was, I had something contagious. And they took away my scholarships and for, you know, inherently unbaptist behavior. That's what the head of religious affairs told me. And they threatened other people that if they didn't withdraw fellowship from me, they were going to take theirs away as well. I'm totally over that, by the way. So when I moved to seminary, I thought I was getting a fresh start. I was still going to a Baptist school because it was cheap and it was a good school. I thought that, and honestly, I was going there because it had a reputation for being liberal. And my experience was liberals will put up with anything. So I thought they'd accept me because I was a charismatic. Little did I know that the president of that school was about to clean house. And man, he did. Heads were falling all over the campus. And it went through this radical fundamentalist change. And even though my theology kind of matches up with him now, at the time I was scared to death of him because I didn't want him to know that I was charismatic. And so I went into my own little charismatic closet. And I tried to stay in that closet for as long as I could. And during that time, I literally sat down in class with the intention of not saying a word to anyone. I wrote these letters at the top of almost all of my notes in seminary. S-W-S-T-O-K-Y-B-M-S. Means nothing to you, but this is what it means to me. Speak when spoken to, otherwise keep your big mouth shut. I was intentional to not let people get to know me because I was certain they would reject me, if not castigate me for it. So I withdrew. And I'm very naturally an introvert. You may not know that when, you know, we're hanging out here on a Sunday morning, but I promise you, my most comfortable, I can sit in a crowded room and be very comfortable not talking to anyone. Uh, I can be very comfortable for days on end without other human contact. And I know some of you use introversion as an excuse to be a cold fish. Well, this is the wrong well if you're wanting to pull up a bucket full of sympathy when it comes to that because I, I have fought against that. But during that season, I reverted to it and I became very introverted. And one of the, one of the downsides of that unintentionally for me was how I came across 
was not like a shy person. I came across like I was aloof. I came across like I was a snob. I came across disinterested. And that certainly wasn't the case. But by the time I got to my late 20s, y'all, I had no one outside of my immediate family that I could share any significant aspect of my life with. And there is no more lonely place to be than in a crowded room. And in crowded rooms, I sat there by myself. And it wasn't because the world was mean. It was because I did that to me. Stop trusting people. I looked around and I thought pretty much every relationship around me was a sea of casual, disposable acquaintances. No real friends. I know this probably isn't very emotional for you, but it is for me. (laughs) My last two years of seminary, that changed, and I'm very grateful for that. It started when I had my first real encounter with the prophetic. In it, a man who was a total stranger to me. I mean, he'd never seen me before that day. There was no doubt in my mind that God was in this moment. He, he began praying for me, and I'm grateful that the prophetic word was recorded because I didn't hear almost all of it. Because as he was praying for me, one of the first things out of his mouth was this. He said, Lord, I pray that you would Help this man to not feel like he's on the outside looking in. And I pray that you would give this man friends. Now, I had repressed so much that I'd almost not, I'd stopped noticing how alone I was. You know, I've heard that people on the verge of death from starvation actually lose their sense of hunger. And that's where I was, pursuing ministry. It's supposed to be a thing about people. But I was totally other from the people that I was trying to reach. Felt like I had to be. So when I heard those words, I, I went and I broke. I mean, it was ugly. Made my face all pucker up. I make that ugly crying face. And, and, and you, know, you know, women are rushing at me with Kleenexes. And I'm like, no, no, I'm okay. Let me have it. <laughs> and I became aware of the hole that existed in my life. I was happy with my family. I was happy with my children, but I didn't have friends. I began to pray in line with that prayer that he spoke over me that night, and I'm very grateful to say that within weeks, I met one of the dearest friends that I have in the world. His name's Greg Hall. He's been here a few times and will no doubt be back again. But we developed a, a strong friendship that endures to this day. And, and from that time until now, I can testify to you that the Lord has blessed me with some incredible friends. Friends who the Lord has used in my life to make everything about it more vibrant. Friends who in all seriousness, have been the difference between living and dying for me, the difference between being delivered and being destroyed by the stuff of life. And I am grateful, I am thankful, and I praise God for the people that he has redeemed and brought into my life. I am profoundly thankful. So I'll repeat once again, I know the value of having close friends. 
I wonder if you do. Sociology bears this out. There was an Australian study of people in their 70s that showed that people who had a strong friendship group other than family, a strong friendship group, lived 22% longer than those who didn't. It actually had a direct correlation to to their longevity. And per this report, friends showed to be more important than even family when it came to living a long life. Close friendships have been shown to measurably reduce stress and all the health concerns that go with that. I read a study this last week that showed that not having friends was just as unhealthy as being overweight and as smoking as far as its negative effect on your health. But in spite of this importance, and I can trace it through the scripture and, I can, and you can trace it through sociology and psychology as well, but in spite of its importance, I also know that true friendships are one of the things that's being lost in our culture. There was a 2004 study by the American Sociology Review. I know that was 15 years ago, but I, I, or 18 years, no, it is a while back. But, but I, I know it was a while back, but, but hear me, I think that it's gotten worse since then. But back in 2004, it showed that the number of non-family confidants, that's people who you really share life with, the number of non-family confidants had dropped 30% in the previous 20 years. There's nothing that suggests that's gotten any better since then. A full 80% of those that responded said they had no one outside of family that they could discuss serious personal issues with. And a quarter of those people said, even counting their family, they had no one that they could discuss the serious stuff of life with. Guys, this is especially true of men. Here's one of the things that, when I read it, it gave me an aha moment, and I appreciated the truth of it, that men typically make and keep friends up until the point they get married. And then they stop making friends and start drifting from their previous ones. I don't want to belabor the point, but friends, I'm saying a mouthful when I use that word at you. Friends, we need each other, and we need friendships. You need people to invest in, and you need people to invest in you. We need people, in addition to our family, who share our faith and are a part of our lives and we're a part of theirs. We need community and we need it within the household of faith. We need close friends within that. I don't mean necessarily just this church, but within the faith itself. And this passage that I'm about to read points out a significant truth that there is no better friend than Jesus who is always with us. He's always concerned about our needs. We've gone through these chapters and I've been amazed that on the, on the precipice of Jesus about to give his life, he was spending all of his time addressing the needs of these men. He's generous to us. He's always there to help us. He prays for us. In desperate circumstances, he doesn't pull away. He actually seeks to draw closer to us. He gives us access to his strength. He gives us access to his wise counsel. And ultimately, he gave his life for us so that he and the Father might forgive us and be in eternal relationship with us. He is a true friend. It's true friendship in that Jesus chose us to be a part of that friendship. 
He made the first move. But it's also true friendship and the kind of true friendship that we're not just called to be in with Jesus, but we're also called to give and be in with other people. That's one of the fruit that Jesus is speaking of here. It's a fruit of being connected to the vine that you build, establish, and maintain good friendships. It's the kind of friendship that people within the faith can and should enjoy. Serious breakdowns when people within the household of faith cannot call one another friends. And it's the kind of friendship that we all desperately need. Take back, take a breath, and I want to dispel one thing before I say anything further. If your family were enough, I'm talking about your biological family, he would have never placed you in the body of Christ to be a part of his family. I am grateful for my family, and I'm very close with them. It's a miracle of the grace of God, the, the, the depth of the relationship that I have with my children, and I am grateful for it, but I need more from them. I want you to know that my kids don't need me as a friend. They need me as dad. It's one of the great, you know, I don't care if they ever say, Dad is my best friend. Now, we ain't gonna girl talk. Okay, Dad's gonna be Dad. And they need me to be Dad. And I need what they can give as well, but I need more. And you need more than what exists just within your biological family. That's part of what this passage is really about. It's about valuing Jesus as our friend, and that's very important. But it's also about learning from him to build and maintain many good friendships alongside a few close, intimate friendships from within the body of Christ. Now, that was a long introduction, but it brings me to my passage. John's Gospel, chapter number 15 beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray together. Lord, I would ask that the Spirit of God would superintend the preaching of the Word and the hearing of the Word today, and it all might be for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. In the previous passage, we saw the last verse, verse 11, was actually the key to understanding all of it. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I, I taught you that the previous 10 verses were supposed to, that, that they had to reference that, that everything Jesus was saying in those first 10 verses was about his joy being in you and your joy being full. This week's passage is very similar. Verse 17 is the cure or is the, is the uh, key to understanding everything from verse 12 down. These things I command you so that you love one another. And in this context, the one another he's talking about is no doubt the remaining 11 disciples. Remember that Judas has already made his way. But 
the commands that he's giving in these verses have one primary intention, and that is to inspire them, to give them cause to love each other. And as you look closely, I I pray that you do hear this isn't suggestions that Jesus has given. He very intentionally uses the word command twice in this passage. Command. That is him telling you what to do. What gives him the right to do that? I don't know, being the creator and Lord over all. So he commands it. It's not optional. It's not a suggestion. And as you look closely, I believe that you'll be able to see that what Jesus is actually doing here is nothing more than pointing out to them the way that he has already loved them and already befriended them. He said, I want you to look at me. He's the consummate disciple maker and teacher who leads by example. He doesn't just say, go and do. He shows it to you and then says, go and do what you have seen me do. You've watched the way I love you. I call you friends. Now go love each other the same way. So over the next few weeks, really, I'm going to point out a number of things from this passage that I believe are ways Jesus has befriended us. Things that are both a cause for celebration because we have such a great friend in him, but they're also a call to action because we are supposed to exercise these same things toward people within the faith. But we're only gonna look at one of those things this morning, and it comes from verse 13, and I would sum it up this way. True friendship requires sacrifice. True friendship requires sacrifice. Verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Jesus was not a friend in word only. I wonder if Solomon wasn't speaking prophetically about Jesus when he said Proverbs 18, 24, which reads this way, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. To interpret that, it means that there are, there are people who have, might have many people who say they're friends, but when ruin visits your life, Your true friends will stick close. I want to be a sticker. I want to have some stickers around my life. It's one thing to say I'm a friend in word, but when ruin comes, that's what reveals true friendship. And anytime you put that kind of love into action, I want you to know, friend, if you're going to be a sticker, it's going to come with some degree of personal cost. Look at the cost to Jesus. He left the splendor of heaven. He became a man, beginning in the helpless form of a baby. He lived a life, really, of poverty by all of our standards. He suffered at the hands of those he created. In one sense, I believe his whole life could be looked at as as laying his life down for the good of other people. And that, of course, culminated when he died a very gruesome death. And he did all of this so that the Father may be glorified by you and by I being forgiven. He did it to give us an example of righteousness, and he did it to suffer the punishment that you and I deserved. That's what happened on the cross. You deserve the punishment of hell, but Jesus, in love, went to the cross and suffered the penalty of your sin and my sin so that we might have eternal relationship with the Father. For you to be forgiven, somebody was going to have to pay the price. It meant either you were going to pay the price for it in hell or Jesus was going to pay the price for it on the cross. I'm grateful for the price that he paid. The 
This is one of those things that you have got to embrace and never forget. For Jesus to be your friend, he had to pay a very, very high price. And I pray that in the same spirit, you can hear this today as well. If you're going to have and maintain friends, you're going to have to sacrifice for them. Next week is friendship day here at Grace. I don't want to exaggerate or paint an ugly picture about this and make it seem like having friends is nothing more than a life of taking your lumps. That's not the case. What good friendships offer is exponentially more than what they cost. Hear that. What good friendships offer is exponentially worth more than what they cost. And true friendship is not a forever one-sided thing. That isn't really friendship at all. That's, one cur- that's just one person being kind. We're talking about a relationship here where there is give and take, one for the other. And I, I'll just say this, that, that I, I don't commit myself deeply to people who are only in the relationship to take from me. And I don't think you should either. Some people don't want a friend. What they want is a benefactor. They, they, they seek out relationships with no intention of anything other than getting their needs met. And I pray you hear me when I say this. I can't meet all your needs. You need Jesus for that. And I can't climb up on the cross for you. You really need Jesus for that. But I'll tell you what we can do. If you're running after Jesus and I'm running after Jesus, we can run after him together. And as he meets my needs, I might be able to be used by God to make up a deficit in your life. And as God is meeting my needs, I might be able to make up a deficit that is happening in your life. God uses us for each other, but real friendships are not utterly one-sided. And even the best of friendships will at times come with personal cost. If you're going to be a friend, there are going to be times when that friend has need. And you're going to have to place their need ahead of your own. Jesus did that when he gave up heaven, lived as a man, and laid down his life. And every enduring relationship will go through moments or even seasons of one-sidedness. That's expected. And if any relationship is ever going to last, it's going to have to go both ways. If you have a friendship long enough, There are going to be seasons when this friend needs more. And there are going to be seasons when this friend needs more. But it's reciprocal if it's healthy. When you befriend someone, you agree to bear some of the burdens of life together. If I'm your friend and something bad happens to you, I'm going to be hurt by that. I'm going to feel it along with you. It's what it means to be a friend. Furthermore, if we're friends long enough, there are going to be times when someone offends you in that friendship, and you'll have to suffer the consequences of what they do in order to forgive them. And listen, there's nobody perfect, and any long-standing friendship that I have, there's been some muddy water that's gone underneath the bridge, flowing both directions from time to time. But the reason I still have those friendships is not because we have never offended one another. It's because when that offense did come, we were ready to pay the price personally to offer forgiveness. I know it sounds awful, but forgiveness always comes with a personal price to the one who offers forgiveness. God didn't make it optional, though. That price is not a suggestion, it's a command. But I would say that it's a benevolent command because unforgiveness is prof- 
profoundly unhealthy. It's profoundly destructive. And it will not only affect the relationship with the person that you're offended with, but it will poison every single relationship that you have and affect much further reaching than you could ever imagine. It'll even affect your relationship with God. It's madness to live in unforgiveness. It's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. God loves you too much to let you be at peace with living that way. He loves you too much. He doesn't want you to suffer the consequences of unforgiveness. And so he'll convict you. And you won't be able to get away from it if you're in him until you agree to personally pay the price to release the debt. And that's what forgiveness is. It's releasing a debt. It's saying, you don't owe me a thing. I am so thankful that Jesus forgave me, that he saw my sin debt in its enormity. I could never repay it. I had no hope of ever repaying it. But he forgave me, and when he did, he said, listen, the debt doesn't exist anymore. I paid the price of it. And if you're going to maintain friendships, you're going to have to suffer some personal consequences in order to forgive. My experience is that most so-called friendships are not capable of enduring one real need or one real offense. Well, I want to tell you, that was good, Pastor Brian. That was real truth right there. That bears out in my life. I've seen that time and time again. That was wisdom is what that was. My experience is most so-called friendships are incapable of bearing the weight of one real need. I mean a messy need, a hard need, the stuff that life deals to all of us from time to time, but most so-called friends won't be able to endure that one need. And furthermore, most so-called friends won't be able to endure one real offense. I'm not talking about that little shirt sleeve stuff that may bug you, but you know you can get over. I'm talking about the hardcore stuff, y'all. I have hardcore offended some of my closest friends. The reason they're still my closest friends is because they paid a price to forgive me. They ate it because the friendship was more valuable. I've done that with others as well. I'll be honest with you. I, I'd, rather be on the, I'd rather be on the side that's offering forgiveness. I hate asking people to forgive me. I really do. I love being magnanimous, though. Yes, I forgive you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes it's really hard, though, isn't it? My experience is that most so-called friendships can't endure even one. I've had some people that were so close to my life, y'all, invested in my life. I had invested in their life, and I would have thought we were lifelong friends. But the relationship could not endure one offense. If you're going to have lasting friendships... It's going to cost you something. Because I'm going to have need. I'm going to be offensive. And I believe Solomon got it right. Proverbs 17, 17 says this. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. Somebody who's really a friend, when the hard time comes... When the hard thing comes, they, they knuckle down and say, I was born for this stuff. 
Have you got friends like that? Are you a friend like that? I hope so. But I also hope that the Lord is gracious to give us more. I'm going to have to treat this like baloney and just cut it off where I get to. I want to diverge for just a minute and tell you how I view friendships because I think it helps to work this out practically in life because there are different spheres of friendship in life. And that's normal and it's natural. And for the sake of clarity, I want to divide these friendship spheres into three. And I want you to picture them almost like concentric circles that get smaller as you get closer to the middle. The largest first level and sphere of friendship is what I would call those acquaintances, those people who are casual friends. They're the types of people that you simply know who they are. You know only trace aspects of their life. You haven't really reached the point of sharing the deeper aspects of yourself with them. These are the people that you know at work, you know at school, you know at church, but you know seldom otherwise. The types of people that are only one step above an acquaintance. And most of the friends that you're going to have in life are going to be this type, the big sphere. The next step in would be a sphere of friendship that I would call the familiar friends, the gang, the people you hang around. They're the type of people that you frequently associate yourself with. And you might not share your innermost secrets with them, but they're still people that you know and at some level trust and at some level know you. I think the distinction at this level of friendship is when you start becoming willing to spend time with them outside of an institutional setting, such as school or church or work, places like this. You do stuff together. And it's very likely that you are going to have significantly fewer of this type of friend in your life. And finally, there's that last circle, the one in the middle, that I would call our most intimate, our best friends. These are the people who really know you. They're intimate friends, those with whom you're personally involved and emotionally attached at an incredible level. They're people with whom whom you share the innermost aspects of your life, people with whom you choose to spend the majority of your free time with outside of family. They're people with whom you would trust your life without question. Generally speaking, uh, you're, you're going to have very few of these types of relationships in your life. I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing. I just observe it to be true. And however, these will, for the most part, be some of the most significant relationships of your life. They might be few, but they're powerful. I think I can spot these different levels of friendship in the life of Jesus. He had a lot of casual friends because Jesus acquainted himself with huge crowds of people who would have said of themselves that they know him. But he had a smaller group of familiar friends. Jesus spent the majority of his free time with 12 men, and he made investment into them. But even among those 12, he had a group of intimate friends, and you see it peppered throughout the Gospels, that that he spent his most intimate times with Peter and James and John. So Jesus even is a great example of how we have friendships at different levels and different spheres. I bring that picture up to you because I need to make this point. Everybody is not going to be your best friend. Just because you're saved does not mean you're automatically best friends with somebody. And nowhere does God command that level of intimacy with everyone. Some people simply don't have the trustworthiness or maturity to be good friends, and it's okay to recognize that that about them. And furthermore, or recognize it about yourself. And furthermore, some people are the best in every way, just excellent in every way, but you don't have enough in common and there isn't an affinity that makes you besties. It's okay. It's not that you dislike them. It's just, you know, they're not in the core group, and that's okay. God doesn't say you have to be best friends with everybody. I would encourage you to keep that group somewhat small. 
But there are going to be people that you hang around the most that are a little bit larger in that center, in that, that second sphere. And those people, you got to hear me. I say this to teenagers all the time, or used to. And so I don't say it a lot because I think you as adults know better. It's probably an assumption, and you know what that means. That the people that you hang around the most need to share a like precious faith. You say, no, 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 i, I got to have friendships for evangelism's sake. I'm going to address that in the coming days. I think those might exist, but they're going to exist in those casual friendships. These people that are closest to you, I would say what Paul said to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And since you will influence them and they will influence you, the better friends that you have need to be people of like precious faith. And I don't commit myself at deeper levels with the hopes of evangelism. I think that's foolhardy. I'll talk about that next week probably. However, you're going to have a few friends. You're going to have a larger group of, of, casual, of, of, these, of these, you know, in, of familiar friends that are part of the faith. But then there's all these other people that you're friendly toward. Listen, you can do evangelism there. That's great. And you need to have people uh, around your life all the time. But you can show yourself friendly to everyone. Hear that again. You can show yourself friendly to everyone. It's just, you know, commit yourself at those deeper le levels with everybody. But you should be friendly to everyone. You can do that to the lost, and you can do that to people who hate you. Because if they hate you, you don't have to hate them back. Am I right there? Just because they hate you doesn't mean that, just because you view me as an enemy doesn't mean that I have to view you as one. And you should, at the prompting of the Holy Spirit, be ready to give sacrificially to any one of these groups at any time. But know this, the closer your friendship is, the more cost will come with it. The closer your friendship is, the more cost will come with it. No doubt, you will inevitably have to invest more time, more emotion, more resources, more life into the best of friends that you have. But here's the upside. You typically won't care because it's motivated by love and love wants to give. In fact, I would say that my closest friends are those people that I look forward to the opportunities to give into their life. It's where I want to make sacrifices. I know that many of you long to have closer friends. I know, I, I know it. And even if you don't long, it might be because you were like me and you've got to the point where hunger has taken you to the point of almost being dead and you lost the urge. But I know this of you, you need friends. I want to make a couple of closing thoughts before I go, before we close. A few things to help you have good friends. We're going to address this more in the coming weeks, but I don't want to finish this morning without talking about it a little bit. If you want to have good friends, show yourself to be friendly. Be an investor and look for places to love on others. Purely looking to see your needs met in a relationship, I pray you can hear me. This is a hard word, but it's really the truth. Purely looking to see your needs met in a relationship is idolatry. You can't look for somebody else to give you what only Jesus can. And if you're only in that relationship to get what you can get out of it, you're a life sucker. In the kindest way possible. So look to be an investor. Don't write people off that you don't really know yet. Listen, some of the best friends that I've ever had, when I first met them, I thought, nah. That's just being honest. I thought, nah. But I've made great friendships with people I didn't think what I would be that interested in initially. 
because of background or age or some form of first impression. I would encourage you to focus your people, your, your energy on people who have a like precious faith. Don't even play with the temptation of really committing your life to someone that doesn't know Jesus. And if you do these things, let me just say, I, I believe you pray about this. I believe that God will present friends to you out of thin air. But if that's going to happen, you're going to have to be willing to risk. Because true friendship is sacrificial. And, and this is going to be especially true for those of you like me who have been hurt. Because in our pain, we recoil and say, nobody's going to do that to me again. Well, rather than letting somebody else hurt you, you're hurting yourself when you do that. If you're scared that if people really knew the ruin of your life, not talking about the Sunday morning facade that we all put on. Y'all look good, by the way. I mean, just on the surface, good job. But is there something in you that says, you know, if you really knew the ruin of my life underneath that facade, you wouldn't love me? There's no way. Well, Jesus did. And the same love that was on Jesus is available to us. And so I would encourage you, why don't you trust the body of Christ to behave like Jesus? Take a risk. Take a risk. They might reject you. You might be totally right. And for that reason, I would encourage you, don't, you know, have you ever met that person, that abject stranger, and within five minutes they're telling you the intimate details of their life? It's like, honey, I don't need to know that. I may never need to know that. Why are, you, why are we talking about this? But you know what I see when I see a person like that? I see a person who doesn't have a good friend. And they're so desperate that they're just indiscriminately trying to find one. And they freak people out because they're coming across as just two. So don't be indiscriminate, but I also encourage you, you don't venture too quickly. Get to know somebody before you venture too much into a relationship. But a good friend is always worth the risk. And every worthwhile relationship that I've had required some level of emotional risk on my part. But I can say without question, they've totally been worth it. I let my struggles and my pain isolate me. I've heard it said pretty often, great statement, buy wisdom as cheap as possible. Well, learning my need for friends and learning how to have and be one cost me my 20s. That's pretty expensive. I wonder what it's cost you. Well, I just want to say that any price I've paid to have the friends I have now is worth it. I wish that you would learn from my mistakes rather than having to suffer through them yourself. But I want to leave you with this assurance. In spite of all your hang-ups and struggles, Jesus still calls you friend if you're in Christ. And he's modeling friendship for you by being the best of friends. It almost sounds disrespectful to call him my friend, doesn't it? He's Lord. Well, here's the deal. He called you friend. He made the first move in that. And I believe that you can have other friends as well. But it starts by deciding to be a good friend. And I believe it starts by embracing the fact that friendship requires sacrifice but it leads to true treasure. It does. Let's bow our heads today. Lord, I, I, this is shockingly how emotional this has been for me. And, um, and if this is tapping in to 
anything within our body. I pray that today that the Spirit of God would bring salve and give us some instruction, give us some direction, bring healing and direct us. I'm thankful to have you as a friend, and you're a great friend. There is no greater friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grieves to bear. I'm grateful. But Lord, you didn't call us to just have you. And, and I pray that, that you would just give us some personal wisdom to see those places where we might have not shown ourselves to be friendly. Or we right now might not be showing ourselves to be friendly. And put it in us that we're going to seek to be an investor. Be willing to give sacrificially and be willing to give greatly sacrificially if that's what it's need, if that's what's necessary to have a truly close friend. And Lord, we call this family, you know, the, the, the church of God, the, the family of God. We call it family, but so often brothers and sisters don't even like each other. Lord, Lord I, I pray that you would draw us closer to one another by inspiring each of us to live as sacrificially as you direct us to live. We don't give everything to everybody, I know that, but we're open to you directing us to give sacrificially to anybody. And I pray for those who don't feel like they have anyone here, that you would move on their hearts, you would open up heaven and pour out blessing on them now, and you would in front of them cause invisible doors to open that leads them to the dynamic necessary relationships that you called us all to. Lord, may it be so, and may it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.